It's Lou Brown with another of my 101 amazing ways for real estate investors like you to win, close more deals, and accelerate your cash flows. Today's tip is number 36, read all the paperwork, know what you're agreeing to. This is so important. I've seen many of my licensees around the country borrow money from third parties they didn't even know what they were getting themselves into. I've seen them borrow from banks, for example. Banks love to take all of your assets, pool them together into one what's called a blanket loan, and then make you subject to them. If they decide that your property is not worth what they think it ought to be worth, they can call that entire loan due. Imagine that that was in that paperwork all along. They have the right at any time that they feel unsecure to literally give you a call and say, by the way, our loan committee met and we decided that we just want to go ahead and receive the money back on that loan. Imagine what you would feel like if you got a call from the bank and that happened. Well, it was all there in the paperwork. And this is one of the reasons I teach my clients not to go to banks and not to qualify for loans. Now I know you may have a great relationship with banks and they love you and they call you up on the phone and they beg you to come get some more money. And I understand. And if you've got one of those relationships, I'm not saying don't do that. And well, maybe I am saying that because if you were to actually understand what to say and how to say it, you'd be able to raise all the money you needed for your deals without going to banks, without qualifying for loans, without paying points, and even without paying closing costs. How powerful is that? So I wanna teach you the right way to borrow money. Always offer to have the interest accrue. This means you make no payments. Wow, how good is that? Well, why would that be good for the lender? Well, let's say they have a retirement account and let's say they've loaned to you at say 6% interest. And imagine that that interest is accruing. That means that every month that you don't make a payment that you owe interest on the original amount borrowed plus you own, owe interest on the payment that wasn't paid. So they can earn interest accruing. Well, what does that mean by the end of the year? Well, let's say that the loan was $100,000. You just saved the payment every month on that. That could help your cash flow dramatically. And what you could do with that additional cash flow is buy more marketing. Marketing will drive the train. When you've got the right marketing, you've got the ability to build an amazing business in the real estate business. But the key is you got to be able to pay for it. Wouldn't it be great if you weren't having to make monthly payments on this private money that I've been teaching you in this series? So what you say to the investor is, would you like to receive uh, annual payments, semi-annual payments, quarterly payments, or monthly payments? And let them choose. If they say monthly payments, you say, well now, of course, when I send that payment in, what's gonna happen to it? You're gonna put it into your retirement account and it's just going to earn what? Zero point something percent, so not much. What if you just let your interest accrue? I'll pay you interest on that as well. So then annually, you can make them a single payment that incorporates both their regular payment and the accrued interest. How cool is that? Only offer collateral if the lender insists. Now, slow that car down and don't get too excited. In this series, I've been sharing with you about borrowing money. Borrowing money without going to banks and without qualifying for loans. That's my favorite way to borrow money. I've got a whole system on this called Borrowing, Volume 6. It's in my system of training you how to become an amazing real estate investor and build a terrific real estate business. You can find that by going to streetsmartinvestor.com, click on tools and click on volume six, borrowing. Now, what I'm sharing with you right now is the fact that in some cases, in many cases, the, the lender really doesn't care about 
putting this against a particular property. Now I'm being very careful to share this with you because I want you to be very extremely powerfully responsible around when you borrow someone else's money that you are in a position to pay that money back. And the thing that really makes it valuable is if you give a mortgage against a property and that property sells, then you have to give the money back because it's secured by that individual property. Well, what that means is Mrs. Jones now got her money back and she's not earning anything on that money while it's sitting there idle. Alternatively though, if you borrow that money on a promissory note, then that money is earning interest the whole time that it's out. So you put the promissory note with a period of time. Maybe it's one year, maybe it's three years, maybe it's five years. And during that period of time, you've got the freedom with that money to keep that money working and you can make a lot more money on it. In this series, I'm going to be talking about when you're closing to purchase a property. So this is going to be focused on areas that affect your bottom line with a thing called a closing statement, right? So sometimes you go to a closing and all of a sudden you're surprised by some of the costs that are on there. Well, it's because you didn't manage those costs. So my suggestion for you on this tip is ask if you can get a reissue fee on the title insurance. This is when your closing agent writes for the same firm that issued the prior title insurance. So in other words, that seller, when they purchased the property, likely also purchased a, what's called an owner's title policy. Well, that owner's title policy has value. And if you can update that, let's say that the seller bought the property five years ago, then the title company would only need to pick up where the other policy left off. You see, a title insurance policy essentially is the day of purchase, but not going forward in terms of anything that might have happened to title after you purchase the property. So when you purchase the property now, let's say it's five years after your seller bought the property, well, they can go back just five years and look to see if anything has been attached or any liens have attached to that property since the last time they checked the title. Well, that can bring a savings to you and to your bottom line. Now in this series, I've been talking about closing your transaction and how you can make some additional profits when you're closing the transaction. So this one is insist that the closing company, closing attorney or title company provide the closing statement to you at least 24 hours before the closing. This allows you to look for mistakes and negotiate fees. All right, so here's what typically happens at a closing. <laughs> you get to the closing, they kind of look out the door and they see that the sellers have arrived and the buyers have arrived and then they go back in there and they actually do the paperwork. Well, we don't allow that anymore. We've learned that we may be sitting there for hours while they're putting together the paperwork. So what, what I've done years ago, I started doing this is just simply telling the closing agent, hey, I want to see those documents and I say 48 hours, but I'll really take 24 hours before the closing. What I want to do is review those documents because almost always there's some kind of mistake on there. And I want you to be careful about that. It's very important. You got to go over the numbers, do the calculations, do your own calculations. Just because they calculated it doesn't mean that the person that typed in the computer didn't get interrupted or let's just say maybe not the sharpest knife in the drawer. So let's be really cautious and careful and conscious about that paperwork particularly. Asking for it in advance gives you time to look at it, get back to them, make changes, and then you can solve the problem. Review, approve, and sign all paperwork for a closing in advance. Do not attend the closing where the seller will sign. You've already signed, saves time and renegotiation. Well, this is one of the most powerful and, and valuable tips I could give you. It used to be that you'd be actually be excited to go to a closing and 
you'd wait and you'd do the paperwork and everybody's sitting around the table and it's a big day in your life and you're purchasing an asset and it's gonna set you up for a better life than the one you've got. And how good is that? It's fantastic is the answer. The challenge is that that's often an opportunity for some kind of breakdown. And if there's a breakdown, if there's an upset with some of the charges, like I've said to you before, sometimes you look at a closing statement and all of a sudden there's all these additional costs and fees you didn't think about. Maybe there was a lien on the title. There's additional costs and fees that you didn't even consider. Well, alarm bell sounding, <laughs> you better pay attention. Anything might happen. So when that happens, you could actually lose your deal over it. How do I know this? I've experienced this. So what I want you to do is be thinking ahead and say, wait a minute. What I'm going to do is require the attorney not only to send the paperwork in advance, I'm going to get it signed and back to the attorney in time prior to the closing then you don't even have to be there. And I'm talking about buying and selling as well. So you don't even have to be present. Nobody said you had to be. You've already signed the paperwork. You agreed to it. Now the seller simply needs to agree to it as well. Now it's not that you're pulling the wool over their eyes. The, the transaction's being closed according to the terms of the purchase and sale agreement that they already entered into. So there should be no issue and no reason for you to be present. On single family and multifamily properties with tenants in them close on the fifth day of the month. Now, why is that powerful? Because what happens is typically now the management company or the owner has already collected the rent from the tenant. So at the closing, because you used my contract, you're actually going to get a credit for what's called a proration of the rent. You see, rents are paid in advance. So on the fifth of the month, only five days have been used up. The rest of the month, if it's a 30-day starting on the first rental, then the rest of the month is a credit to you. Well, if it's a $1,000 rental, <laughs> look at that. You're going to pick up another significant amount of, let's say, three fives is 15. You're going to pick up another $840 approximately of credit towards your closing statement. Well, that might cover most of your closing costs on that transaction. So that could be a really powerful thing. Now, let's accelerate that. What if you were buying a 100-unit apartment building? Wow, closing on the fifth of the month, you get all of those rents credited towards your closing statement. Very powerful. Protecting your assets. Now this little series is gonna revolve around what I believe to be the very best way that you can set yourself up for success, and that's to hold title to your real estate in trust. An amazing kind of trust called a land trust. Now, a land trust is different from other types of trust. It's about 30 different kinds of trusts out there. So this very unique and special trust actually allows us to do things that other trusts don't let us do. And certainly, LLCs, corporations, limited partnerships can't do many of the things that a land trust can do. So it's one of the reasons that I love land trust, dearly love them. So in number 43, we say never own anything in your own name. Always hold title in a land trust. Well, right now you may have your personal residence in your name. You may have your vehicle in your name. You may have your bank account in your name. Uh-oh. Well, if you really think about it, how easy is it for someone to actually look up your name and find out what you own or look up your address and find out who owns it? It's pretty easy in this marvelous day of technology, right? Click, 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 boom. Now here's all the information. By the way, not just that property, but every property you own in that name. Now how scary is that? Because it's so easy for someone. For just a couple of hundred dollars, somebody can file a lawsuit at the local courthouse and go after you. Maybe for no cause at all. Maybe for cause. In any case, you really don't have a way you can regroup or back up. Why? Because the property's already in your name.
So if they were to be successful with their lawsuit, they would get what's called a judgment. That judgment would now attach to your name and anything that's owned by you in your name. So what I believe in and what I suggest is that every property that you own should be not only in trust, not in your name, but in a separate trust, each property in its own trust. Hold your personal property such as autos in a personal property trust. So in the last tip I was sharing with you about a thing called land trust, there's another kind of trust that I dearly love called a personal property trust. Now, a personal property trust is a different kind of trust than a land trust. Personal property trust holds, guess what? Personal property. So in other words, a land trust, duh, holds land. So in other words, if it has a legal description attached to it, then that goes into a land trust. A personal property trust, on the other hand, is everything else in your life. Stocks, bonds, mutual funds, bank accounts, CDs, CDUs, mobile homes, motor homes, gun collections, coin collections, everything else in your life can be held in a personal property trust. How powerful is that? And yes, I said vehicles. Think about the highest liability thing that you probably have in your life. <laughs> it's that vehicle. And oh my gosh, if you've got teenagers, it's not if but when they're gonna have a wreck. And all of a sudden now that can fall back on the parents. And if there's a judgment, everything that you own is literally at risk. Now, am I trying to terrorize you? Absolutely. I want you to understand just how important and powerful that it is that when you own assets in your own name, you are completely at risk in the United States of America. 82,000 lawsuits filed every day in this country, the most litigious society on the planet, 95% of the world's litigation, something that we should not be proud of. And so the only thing we can really do is to plan in advance and make sure that we can't lose. Now I encourage you to go to streetsmartinvestor.com and look at, click on tools and look at volume five, personal property trusts. Hold your bank account in a personal property trust. So as I'm sharing with you in this series, What's available to you is that you can set up your own trusts if you choose to. And one of the things that you can do is simply open a bank account in the name of a trust. And you can actually be the trustee of that trust, by the way. That means you can sign the checks as trustee and your money now is kept separate and apart from your other business. So let's say that you own 10 pieces of real estate and you're receiving rental income off of each one of them. And we know that owning the property can create liability. Well, what happens is that the rents get paid to you as the manager and the money gets deposited in a completely separate account. Have a personal property trust as the beneficiary of your land trust. Well, if you've been following this series, you've learned a lot of very unique and amazing things about this powerful thing called trusts. It's something that most people don't know anything about. It's, it's the most powerful entity I've ever discovered on the planet, and it's something that you need to learn and you need to master. I love being able to pass this on to other folks because of the changes and the benefits that I've gotten from it have been totally amazing. And I've heard, oh, I can't tell you how many testimonials from others that have used my system over the years, been doing this since 1984. So there's an awful lot of uh, experience that's gone with that. And teaching others as well over the last 30 years has been very powerful as well. And one of the great things is this thing called land trusts. And, and when I was saying to you before that this is a unique and powerful entity, I really mean that. Because the land trust, remember, is holding real estate. And I said that a land trust is different than other types of trusts. Well, one of the unique things about a land trust is that you can name the trust anything you choose 
and that it converts real estate into personal property interests. So imagine that with the personal property trust I've been sharing with you over the last few tips, the personal property trust can actually be the beneficiary of the land trust. And that means that now you have a layered trust strategy. If anyone was to ever get through through litigation and discover who the beneficiary is of the land trust, guess what they would find? They would find another trust. And if there's a lawsuit, this is you. And you're just hanging out behind the trust and you're trying to figure out who the beneficiary of this trust might be. Who the rightful heirs are and who is supposed to get those assets or the income from those assets. And who's supposed to pay the bills? Well, all of this is determined in the court system. Now that can cost money, it can be a huge delay, and it can be confounding, confusing, it can break up families because it's the process and all the family members are not aware of what's going on. My strong recommendation, my suggestion to you is do not hold property in your own name. Hold property in this wonderful, incredible entity that God created called trusts. This came over on the Mayflower. It's been around a lot longer than LLCs, corporations, and limited partnerships. And one of the great things is that because you have the trust, because the property is already in trust, you've already determined who the beneficiaries are, then there's no reason for probate. And in fact, trust is the only thing that avoids probate. So doesn't it make sense to avoid the cost, the delay, the aggravation, and the need for an attorney? It can all be eliminated simply by planning your estate now, putting each asset into its own trust, determining who the beneficiaries are, doing all the paperwork now instead of later. And with the process of probate, many things can go wrong and certainly there can be a huge expense that you could avoid. So my suggestion to you is learn the magic of trusts. You can do that by simply going to my website, streetsmartinvestor.com and on tools, learn about it right there. And if you want a live training on it, if you'd like to go to a four day event, go to MaximumAssetShield.com and there you'll find a lot of information. Avoid the do upon sale clause requirement legally using trusts. So in this series, I've been sharing with you about this powerful thing called trust and particularly land trust. Well, one of the most powerful things is, wouldn't you agree, if you didn't have to go to the bank and you didn't have to qualify for a loan and you could actually buy real estate, wouldn't that be awesome? And you don't have to put up your credit report and you don't have to pay a bunch of fees. Uh, the cost of the loan and all those things could be eliminated if you simply negotiate with the seller, as I've shared with you in other tips, and take over their existing financing on the property. Take over the payments on the property. Well, you can do that with a powerful thing called trusts. You see, trusts are one of the exemptions to the due upon sale clause. When the property is placed into trust, the lender is prohibited from calling the loan due. So even your own personal residence, when you place that into trust, guess what? The lender can't call the loan due because of that exception in the law. Now imagine that you could take over somebody else's trust and just continue to make the payments. So I teach you how to do that. It's a powerful thing. It begins on page 148 of this amazing system called land trusts. If you'd like to learn more about that, simply go to streetsmartinvestor.com, click on tools and click on land trusts. We'd be glad to share with you more about that. It's a truly amazing thing that has made me huge profits. Again, think if you do one house without going to the bank and qualify for a loan. Think about 10, think about 20, 
Think about a hundred. Wow. It's just amazingly powerful. Now, I'm going to make this caveat. If you agree to make the payments, if you tell the seller you're going to make the payments, you absolutely positively must make those payments. We're not going to put our sellers at risk. We're not going to put them in a position where they could get hurt. They're giving you an amazing opportunity and an amazing gift. So we always want to treat that with reverence and thank thankfulness and make sure that you do what you're supposed to do when you take advantage of this powerful tool to be able to take over existing financing. It is hard for others to collect judgments and liens with your assets in trust. <laughs> now imagine this, somebody goes to court, they file a lawsuit against you, you have a situation in court, most attorneys will actually admit that many cases are won from technicalities, not even from the law, not even from what was right or what was wrong. They won on technicalities. So the system is so flawed in my opinion and I really don't appreciate it. I don't like it and so I put myself in a position and I suggest that you do the same thing not to be sued in the first place. And one of the ways that you don't get sued is when somebody looks up your name and they do an asset search and don't find anything. They don't find that there's any assets for them to be able to attach or steal or, I mean, a, a capture <laughs> based on a situation. So I teach this to you not to take advantage of others and not to avoid things that are your responsibility. I want you to take personal responsibility for anything that you are responsible for. What I teach you this for is those folks that don't want to do what you did to get what you got. They only want what you got. <laughs> and those kind of folks are out for blood and they're out to really take advantage of you. Well, what we found is when it's expensive and when it's are going to be a hard case to win, then they many times drift away. So my advice is simply don't own anything in your own name and when or if someone were to get a judgment against you personally and you don't own anything in your name, why? Because those things are owned by the various trusts that you might be a beneficiary of or you might not be. That's not published anywhere. So it's nobody's business and that's your opportunity to protect your assets when it's not on public record in your name. Learn the power, learn the magic of trust. It's one of the best things you could ever do. It's served me very well. Been doing trust since 1984 and we've learned that there's some important and valuable things that you get as a result of trust. I've identified over 30 different benefits of trust that you cannot get with any other entity. Not a corporation, not an LLC, not a limited partnership. You can only get it with trust. So it can benefit you greatly to learn about these powerful things called trust. I've got a four day event that we do. It's called Maximum Asset Shield. I would love to see you there. Love to give you more information about what to do and how to do it. You can even bring your own deed to class, your own title to class, and we actually do the paperwork right there in class. So you're gonna get mastery and ownership of a valuable, valuable tool for yourself and your family simply by attending that four-day class. You can learn more about that by calling 1-800-578-8580 or go to MaximumAssetShield.com. Buy right so you can keep some of your fines. The real wealth is in the holding of the property. And I couldn't emphasize that more. I couldn't be a better testimony to that fact that we have bought right and held over many, many years and given people the opportunity to someday end up with home ownership. And as a result, we've got great cash flow and great residents that live in the homes. So one of the things that you're looking for is when you purchase the property, you're looking at financing because when you use hard money financing, it's usually limited to three, six months, maybe a year, and then you're done. You better have that house bought 
fix stuff and sold within that period of time, or the lender could actually call the loan due. I don't like that program. Your second option is you could go to the bank and qualify for a loan and get a brand new 30 year or 15 year loan. I don't like that program either. First of all, you have to put up your own credit. You have to put up your significant down payment typically when it's investment property and they don't count the rent as big, as strong as the amount of rent you're actually receiving towards your being able to qualify for the loans. Also, there's limitations on the number of loans you can get. So I really don't like going to banks and qualifying for loans. And guys, I am a testimony to the fact that you don't have to do that. I have been buying, holding, and selling property now for over 40 years. I've never been to the bank. I've never qualified for a loan on a single family or small multifamily property. And you can too. And you know, the cool thing is I teach you the scripts and what to say and how to say it. Because when we buy right at the beginning, then the seller becomes the bank in a couple of ways. One is I can take over their existing financing on the property. And the second is if there's equity in the property, they can be the bank for me. And so I teach you exactly how to present that to the seller so that the seller sees what's in it for them and what makes sense for them to actually do when they are becoming the bank for you, the buyer. It's an amazing process. And when we say, so you can keep some of your funds, well, what this allows you to do if you've got long-term financing from your seller, now you can offer long-term financing to your buyer and you can actually put yourself in the position to be the bank. Instead of sending your buyers to the bank, instead of you going to the bank, you can actually be the bank. How cool is that? Always use the right rental agreement that will protect you. Well, I'll tell you what, over the years, I've definitely learned that paperwork matters. And if you're serious about this business, you've got to understand that you are in a contract related business, that you're going to contract with sellers, you're going to contract with buyers, you're going to contract with occupants of your property. Sometimes they're renters, sometimes they're buyers. And having the right paperwork is an absolutely critical step in the process. And by that, I mean that you have to have paperwork that protects you, that negotiates for you, and that covers your assets uh, when things uh, get a little wonky, as they sometimes do with crazy people that might move into your property. Uh, so what happens is that we give you the tools to be able to do that. Now, we created many years ago, something we call the standard rental agreement. I literally had a whole group of folks come meet with me, bring their rental agreement, and we sat down and hashed out an amazing rental agreement that started about uh, oh, 30 years ago, in fact. And over the years, every year, I do a process of review. Now, I have a, a level of clients that have been studying and take our system. And what happens is all of them review the agreement every year for any changes or suggestions. And then we publish a new agreement every year. So updating your paperwork is also a critical piece as laws change, as dynamics change, as humans change. We need to make sure that we have the right words and it matters a word a phrase, a sentence, a paragraph. Those are solutions to problems that could present themselves at a later time. Now in the rental agreement, it can contain some additional things we call profit centers or additional income that is available to you in your business. Now, when I say additional income, this is over and above what you make the difference between your mortgage payment and what you rent the property for. No, this is much more than that. We have about 25 different profit centers that are available to you in your business. Pet fees, pet rent, extra person rent, additional rent, maintenance taken care of by your client uh, under certain circumstances. There's levels of things that can be covered in behaviors. And so the right rental agreement actually controls the behavior of the person 
that's going to be occupying your property. So having the right documentation allows you to fall back on not being emotional, not getting upset, but actually going back to what the agreement was in the beginning. How important is that? The agreement in the beginning is critical so that you can always use that as a platform in discussions with your client. We've even already written letters. When they don't do what they're supposed to do, we've already got a letter for that. Now that's in my volume eight, Property Management, where we have all the letters for someone to actually be able to fall back <laughs> on what was agreed to because it's excerpted out of the agreement and put it right into the letter that you now send to the client. So check out our standard rental agreement. It's located in volume two, selling and holding, and also in volume eight, property management. Like this, share this, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'll see you soon. Yeah, baby. Thank you.